This is our Thanksgiving month. Our Thanksgiving month. Can somebody say Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving. Yes, it's the end of the year and we want to begin preparing our hearts to thank God for having been gracious to us. Despite all what we have gone through, not every month was the month of, of November. No. Other months were months of blessings and bliss. Other months were months when God ministered to us and blessed us. And therefore, we want to take this opportunity to begin thanking God for what he's done for us. And our scripture reference is uh, Psalms 95, verse 1 to verse 2, that we'll be running with in this month, that says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. And therefore, I'm calling my sermon, I'm giving it a heading, Come with Thanksgiving. For the next two weeks, I said, this time, Pastor Joyce has preached enough and uh, my elders here. I've been missing the pulpit. So for the next two weeks, I'll be preaching. Yeah? After the Thanksgiving Sunday, then we shall release you to go for Christmas. And we are calling our someone, come with thanksgiving. Pastor Joyce, we never agreed with you over this scripture. But that's my someone, okay? She's the one who, who creates all these labels here. Okay? And it says, oh, come. Can somebody say, oh, come? So we are coming... We are singing to the Lord. We are actually shouting joyfully. We are coming to the rock of our salvation. We are coming before him with what? With thanksgiving. Now, this is the, the psalm I want us to look on as we shall be looking into the next few, for the next two or three weeks. It says this, Psalms 100 verse 1 to verse 4. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Just like it begins there. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Come into his presence again with singing. Know that the Lord is God. Very important. Know that the Lord is God. Then he says, it is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Then he says, give thanks to him, bless his name. That's all in Psalms 100. What a powerful psalm. We may be seated in his presence. Amen. Father, we thank you again for your word, and we are grateful that we can share it together. As I speak, may you give me unction, may you help me to share this word. Come with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, I'm calling this message, Come with Thanksgiving. All right? And before we do anything, I want us to look at the definition, the definition of the word Thanksgiving, And I've picked one which, according to one man who has written, uh, who is one of the Bible scholars, done a, a, very good, a very good dictionary called the Strong's Dictionary. According to Strong's definitions, the Hebrew word for Thanksgiving is a word we call, I don't know whether I'm going to pronounce it properly, we call todo, tod, 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 help me here. Okay, toda. That's the meaning of the word thanksgiving, toda. Toda. And it means there are three things in thanksgiving. You know, I've come to discover that if you want really to understand the Bible, understand the meanings. This is why I tell people, when you want to read the Bible, have your Bible with you, have a dictionary with you, have a what? A concordance with you, and possibly you can also have an explanatory notes with you from credible people. Pastor Joyce will tell you because she's a scholar. It will help you to get some things which perhaps you have no idea about. Because this month, people will be running around with Thanksgiving. And some think Thanksgiving is simply giving money. Others may be thinking Thanksgiving is enjoying and having, eating food. In the U.S., last month on 14th of November is when they have their Thanksgiving Day. I think it's 14th or what? I think 20, 20 what? 26th of November. And uh, them, to them, Thanksgiving is a turkey. You know, turkey. A turkey and, and uh, this thing, this... You call it what? This, this, uh, uh, this, this, this thing that looks like a watermelon. Pumpkins. Okay, they enjoy pumpkins and they enjoy turkey. And of course, they have a reason behind it, which is scriptural, I could say, when you come into the reason for their thanksgiving. But according to Strong's definitions, the Hebrew word thanksgiving is toda. And it means three things. Number one, confession. Number two, praise. And number three, what? Offering. Confession, praise, and offering. Now, when we give thanks in the truest sense of the biblical word, actually we offer God our praises. 
and acknowledge to him that he is the giver of all things. So the true meaning of thanksgiving is us offering God our praise like we have done, and indeed as we have seen in that scripture that we have quoted there, and number two, acknowledging him as the giver of all things. I think I've shared this off often over and over again, but because we always have new people coming in church, I don't mind sharing it. The giver of all things and the giver of all the gifts that we have. So in this definition that Strong gives us, we find three things which I will dwell on for the next two weeks. Today, I want to talk about come with confessions. Come with what? Confession. Come with confession. We see the word confession, then we see the word praise, and we see the word Offering, offering, confession, faith, uh, praise, and offering. Now, our ordinary dictionary, just the ordinary dictionary, if you can go to it, it, may, it, it says it gives thanksgiving this definition. It says it is the act of giving thanks, grateful acknowledgement of his benefits or his favors, especially to God. Now, when I'm saying thank you to you, I'm actually Becoming, I'm actually giving, I'm, I'm actually becoming grateful. I'm acknowledging what you are to me. You gave me a gift and I received that gift. I would say thank you. When I'm saying thank you, I'm acknowledging that you've been grateful or you have been graceful or you have, been, or, or you have given me certain favors in my life. This is what the dictionary says. It's simply a celebration and acknowledgement of divine favors and kindness. From this definition, it therefore follows that thanksgiving is the act of recounting God's wonderful deeds. This month, we will be recounting. Recounting is going back and looking at what God has done for you. For some of us who've gone through some hits, we've been hit by the enemy from one point to another, we will forget what the hits that the enemy has given to us. And we will begin to look at the benefits that God has given to us. Because the Bible says, in all things, it doesn't say for all things. Thanksgiving are not given for all things. It's given in all things. It doesn't matter how, whether bad or good. The Lord gives you an opportunity to see his goodness even in those bad things that are happening in your life. I looked at the life of Job and I realized Job, if there was any man in the Bible who went through a very difficult time, it was Job. And especially when Job had lost everything that he had, especially his family. We condemn Job and we say he made a statement when he says God gave and God has taken that we were actually like, uh, we, 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 um, some preachers they say that Job didn't know what, he, no, no, no. Job understood that even what he had belonged to God. That's what he understood. And because of the confession when he made, God has taken, he didn't end like that. It says, therefore, praise be to God. You can read your scriptures. Job ended up, I mean, making an acknowledgement, giving thanks to God even in the most difficult of things. No wonder the Bible tells me the end of Job was better than the beginning of it, the, the beginning thereof. In thanksgiving, we give God the praise. Actually, it is an act of recounting God's wonderful deeds. It is a way of telling of his wondrous works. Thanksgiving is an acknowledgement of God's great benefits or favors that he has given towards his people. And you will see David in the Bible as one man who talked a lot about thanksgiving. In fact, you can never go beyond two, three psalms in the scriptures without seeing the word thanksgiving coming on. Coming on. So we, we, it's, it's God's acknowledgement of God's great benefits or favors towards his people. Now, in introduction, there are three things that I want to talk about in this first session of my teaching on come with thanksgiving. Number one, I want to talk about God's blessing on man. God's blessing on man. In other words, God's blessing on us as it were from the beginning. Then I'm going to talk about briefly on God's, I'm going to talk about the curse upon our provision. And finally, number three, I will talk about the thanksgiving of confession. The thanksgiving of confession. Let's begin with God's blessings upon man. Because you, you always thank God for his favors that he has bestowed upon you. From January up to December, what is it that God has done for you that you can thank him for? This year, some of us never knew we would be where we are today. Some of us never understood, we would, some would leave us as they have left us. <clears throat> there are many of us who never understood God will give us husbands and give us wives. I don't know how many we, we waited on this pulpit since the beginning of the year, including Shikuku yesterday. 
I missed that one. Shikuku. You know, Shikuku, many times it aborted, but it happened this time. All right? Now, we never knew God would bless us with children. We never knew God would give us jobs. Some of us never knew God would give us favors in our lives and in our families. Some of us never knew God would keep us alive until today. So when we go back and we recount, we see the blessings of God. But how does this come in? How did it begin? I will begin by telling you, from the beginning, God never intended for man, you and myself, to live the kind of life that we are living. He never intended us to live a miserable life. And you will see when God created Adam, the first man on the face of the earth, the first thing that God did was to make provision for him. God made provision for Adam. And believe me, the will of God is to make provision for you. That's the will of God. God does not intend for you to live without provisions. Of course, we know the basic provisions is food, clothing, and shelter. Those were the first things God gave Adam in the Garden of Eden. Because when you go into the Bible, in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 to 18, and I'm going to read very fast, because I have, I have 20 minutes to capture this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 to 14, the Bible says, And the Lord planted a garden in Eden, in the east. The Lord planted a garden. He had already done everything and made everything. Men, were, animals were there, everything was there. Already in existence, God has already created the heavens and the earth. The stars are there and everything. God deliberately planted a garden. He never said, let there come a garden. God went down and did plant a garden. That's what the Bible says. He planted a garden in Eden. I'm sure we're reading together. Genesis chapter what? Chapter 2, verse, 14, verse, 8, to verse, verse 8 to verse 14. Could you please flash it? Chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 14. Uh, media, I think that on, on, the, on, the, on, on, the, on the screen is better than my face. Please. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 14. It says, the Lord God planted a garden eastwards in Eden. And there he put man whom he had formed. So you can see God is now making provision for Adam. He has made Adam and he cannot allow Adam to, 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 to exist without a provision. It says, and out of the ground the Lord God made, a, uh, the Lord God made to spring up every good tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Those are provisions. God made sure Adam had, had something which he would be pleased with. The eyes of Adam when they beheld the Garden of Eden, the Bible tells me it was pleasant in the sight of Adam. And not only pleasant, it was also good for food. To tell me God also wants me to feel pleasurable in my life. Amen. Are you getting what I'm talking about? He does not only want you to eat anything. He wants you even in the, the environment you are in should be a pleasant environment. All right? He wants you to operate in a world that is good to you. So he made it pleasant to the sight and good for food. They say the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now look at this. It says, and a river, in verse, in, 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 in verse 10. It says, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became four, it became four heads. So there was also a river that went in the garden of Eden. And that river parted into four. And the purpose of that river was basically to water the garden. So that, I, 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 I'm sure Adam's job was simply to walk in that garden and enjoy himself. And I'm trying to imagine this is what God intends for you to become. Amen. I know somebody is not getting my point here. If you believe it, say amen. amen. And by the way, you know we are setting now pace for next year. So if you miss this, it will continue the way it has been this year. But I'm telling God my year must change. The new year must begin what? To change. I'm setting pace for that. So he says in the garden, it parted and became four heads. Okay? To tell me, sometimes God, does, God doesn't depend on only one source in our lives. Yeah. Your provisions are not based on your salary only. I don't, I don't know how this year was. This has been a year with many things. Especially in Kenya. <laughs> eh? Many things. Eh? Many things. You know what I'm talking about. The price of flour. The price of what? Sugar, the price of fuel, school fees. I'm sure when you look at your, your space slip, you even wonder why you go to work every day. But the good news is that even this river that is flowing into your life has four heads. Some will come from your friends. Others will come from some business somewhere. Others will just come and say, Bishop, you know what? God spoke to me yesterday night, and this is a check for you. Because it, it went into how, many, in, in, into how many heads? 
into four heads. Let's continue reading, people. Then it tells me it went into four heads. Four heads. Okay, four heads. Verse 11. The name of the first, four heads, verse the name of the first is Pison, which, is, which encompasses the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. So you see, when God cared for Adam, Adam lived in a golden garden. The river was, was actually full of what? Gold. Move to the next one. It says this, gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is billiam and there is oinkstone. I, I know these things, some of you even know, don't even know them. You, never, you don't even know how an oinkstone looks like for some of us here. Then verse 13 says, 13, and the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is that which encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And then verse 14, and I guess verse 14, 14 is the end. It tells me, and the name of the third river is Hedikel. That is that which goes to, towards the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. My emphasis here is that God made provision for Adam. That's my emphasis. The first thing God gave man was provision. And when we give thanks, we give thanks for his provision. His provision. God doesn't just put you there, by the way. Let me tell you, even the little food that you have on your table... It's God who has provided it to you. So he made Adam, put him in the Garden of Eden, and God gave Adam everything that Adam needed for his provision and also for his pleasure. For his pleasure. Now the garden was a special, a, a special part of the, gra- of the land or the ground which God had made. And if you read, if you want to find out the meaning of the word garden, it simply means a, spe- a piece of land or of ground or other space commonly with ornamental plants trees, etc., used as a park or other public recreational area. Now, don't imagine the Garden of Eden was like the shamba you have in Kakamega. I don't want you to imagine that. It's not like the, the shamba in Yandarua, my brother. The Garden of Eden was a pleasant place to be. Very wonderful place to be. Ornamental plants. Ornamental plants are those plants which are not normal, which you don't just get anywhere. The Bible didn't say, and God gave Adam land. God gave Adam, planted a garden. Think of a garden where you walk in and you see flowers. A garden where you walk in and you see uh, 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 fruits. A garden where you walk in and you hear birds singing. The grass is so nicely done. And everything in that garden is so sweet and so wonderful. That is exactly what God intended man to be. And I'm sharing this to you because I want to set into, your motion, into motion in your heart that the will of God for you is to have the best that he can give to you. Amen. The best that he can give to you. It is not God's will for you to live in the worst. Now, this was to be Adam's source for his living. God made the ground to be a source of his provision, a source of sustenance, and also a source of his settlement. The ground was a blessed place intended to be productive and good for every need that man had. And how do I know that? Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 16. We've seen up to verse 14. 15 to 16 says, And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it out and to keep it. And the Lord commanded man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. I love this word. There is a word which I like in verse 15. Okay? Verse 15, it says, if you go to verse 15, the Lord put man in the garden and took and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The word dress it and the word keep it. Those are two, two, two different things. Dress it and keep it. It means the garden, was, has, the, the garden was basically a place where God had given to Adam for two good things. Two good things. To dress it and to keep it. Dress and keep, I'll come to that definition much later. But I want to say this. Presently, the ground is anything that God has given to man to be the source of his provision, sustenance, and settlement. Today, when I use the word garden here, don't confuse with a small garden at the backyard of your house. When I use the word garden here, I'm talking about that which God has given to each one of us as our source of provision, Number two, our source of sustenance. And number three, our source of settlement. It means every, the, the thing which God has put in your hand, it must be pleasant. And it must be something which you will dress and something which you will keep. 
I'm Pastor Mlema. You know, my, 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 my garden is you. Tell your friend we are Bishop's garden. So listen, I need to make sure that you are pleasant. And I make sure you, I will keep you. Every Sunday I come and I stand here and I look at you, I, I, I feel nice. And I feel good. It should be my duty to make sure that whenever I stand here to minister to you, I enjoy doing it. It should never be a burden to me. It should be my duty to get the best that I can make out of you. To put value into your life. And you will see the meaning of the word dress and the meaning of the word keep. Let me move a little bit further here. If you go into the Bible, it says in chapter 1 and verse 28, Genesis, it says then God blessed them and God said unto them, after he had put them in that garden, and this is the blessing, or rather the thing which I would want to see God do in our lives as we enter into the year 2024. Let's go to that scripture there. Media, please keep me on my scriptures. Media. I hope my media man there will help me here. Media, keep me on my scriptures on this screen. The other one, you can put my face. All right. Now, in verse 20, I'm on what, verse what? 28. 28, media. 28, it says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, that's Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them, and God said unto them, help me here. What did he say? That's a scripture we know. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Then he says, and do what? And replenish and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So the garden wasn't just enough. God commanded man and God blessed man. He blessed man. Thanksgiving is when we come to God to thank him for his blessings. Thank him for his favors. It means God has favored us. He has blessed us. And because God has favored us and he has blessed us, we come to him with a heart of gratitude. We come to say, Father, thank you for blessing me. Thank you for taking care of me. It is in this garden, the Bible says that God blessed man. And it meant this, it meant man was never to live a life of struggle. Never to live a life of struggle. God intended for man to live a life of bliss. The work God gave Adam was only twofold, as I say, to dress and to keep it. Whenever God, whatever, whenever God gives man his provision, it is meant to bless him. It is meant to make you a blessing. All what is required of you is to dress it up and to keep it. Genesis 2.15. The Lord took man, put him in the garden of Eden, as I've said, and he said, dress it and keep it. And I was looking at the definition of the word dress and keep. Let me just give to you this. Dress and keep. What does he mean by the word dress? Because we may be wondering, when he told Adam, dress it, what did God mean? To dress is basically to trim. To trim. I think I put it in my definition. Media, if you could just go to it so that my people here can be able to see it. The word dress in my notes. It's simply to, 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 it's simply to, to trim, to ornament, to adorn. It, is simp it simply means to add value and make something better. You know, dressing is when I have a plant which is already grow, it has already grown. My job is simply to prune a little bit of it. Just, just make sure that it's, I'm adding value, value to it. It's already mine, but I'm simply adding a little value on that specific thing that you've given to me. To ornament it. Ornament means, we may know the meaning of the word ornament, ornament ornaments, isn't it? You see, we, we are nicely done, but we, we put a bit of, Makeup. If you look at our sisters here, you will see they're not the way our brothers are. There's a bit of hair which we put on. Some of us, we have got some earrings, and some of us, we put some. You call it balm or lipstick? I was told balm is a better word of... Is it balm or lipstick? Put on balm. Some of us, we put a bit of powder. But when you look at Allah, he doesn't care about those things, isn't it? So actually, to ornament is when you add value to yourself. But you see, the thing is yours. God is simply telling you add value. That's what he was telling Adam to do. You don't need to struggle about anything. You have it, simply add value. In fact, I came to discover adding value was as simple as just eating. You take the fruit you eat, 
And as you eat, another fruit grows on it. And it was in abundance. It was not in little measure. It was in abundance. Well, that's what God meant for Adam. And then number two, to keep is simply to hold, to maintain, to retain in one's possession. And this word is normally used. Pastor Joyce may have used it yesterday. Are you the one who was marrying my brother? Here yesterday. He says to hold and to do what? And to keep. It means you take ownership of what God has given to you. Now I'm imagining the Garden of Eden has been given to Adam to take ownership. And I strongly believe this. When God gives you his provisions, he doesn't give them for you for a temporary time. He gives them to you to keep and to hold. Amen. This is why I'm praying next year. God will give us that which we shall keep and hold. Not, not, not today you are employed, the following day he has taken it away from you. No, no, no. Not today you are temporary. We want to be permanent. Because our God is a God who keep, gives us to keep. Maybe this year nothing happened, but I can assure you next year. I'm speaking into the year that is coming. It will not be the same as this year. Next year will be a year with a difference. Because the Lord's provision will be made available to us. So he gave Adam the Garden of Eden, number one, to add value. And number two, to keep. And I believe this is what God does whenever he blesses his people. He gives it to you for your keeping. He said, I've been wondering why the war with Israel and, 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 and the, is it Palestinians or who? The Palest and I realize they have every right to keep their land. So I don't sympathize with those, with whatever has been going on in, in Israel. Because God gave them that land to hold and to keep. By the way, it's theirs. If you believe the Bible, you'll say amen. amen. But if you don't believe the Bible, you'll begin saying, Pastor, they have killed so many people. Let me tell you, that was his way from the beginning. Even when they were taking that land, he killed. They killed to have it. And anybody who tries to cross your path for what God has given to you will die. Yeah. Oh, you didn't get me. I, I know some of you are saying, Pastor Mlemo, your language is beca becoming tough. I'm telling you the truth. If the devil comes across what God has given to you, the devil must surrender it. Yeah. And we must come to the place where we are not on the offensive. Yeah. Huh? We are not on the place where we are on the defensive. We are on the offensive side, sorry. Where we are defending what God has given to us and offending the devil to ensure that what is mine, nobody takes it away from me. That's what he gave to Adam. And he told Adam, I've given you this for your keeps. By the way, God never intended for you to struggle. Tell your friend, no more struggles in my life. You know, there are moments when we take things very lightly. But I'm refusing, I'm saying, if 2023 was a year of struggle, 2024 will be a year of no struggle in my life. If this year was a year where we were, under, we were molested, no more molesting. Because God doesn't give us his blessings to make us. There's a scripture that says he does not bless us for what? He gives us the blessings to make us rich. And it, thank you, it adds no what? Sorrow. In fact, you are coming to my message now. It adds no sorrow. It doesn't add any sorrow. And believe me, any, 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 any blessing which, bring, which brings sorrow in your life doesn't come from God. This is why I believe the blessings of God make rich. They make rich. Anything which is from God, you enjoy it. Sikia, kama ni kazi ni mungu utafraia. You will wake up in the morning, it may be hard work, but when you wake up in the morning, your heart rejoices. But if it's anything from the enemy, it will give you sorrow. Adam was given the land, the garden. God planted the garden for him. And he did so, so that Adam can enjoy every good thing that God intended for Adam to enjoy. My time is up, and I'm not going to point number two. But let me go to point number two. I'll just introduce it. Next Sunday, I can pick it from there. There's no issue, okay? Point number two was this. But because of sin, listen, the only thing which is a problem in our lives is sin. That's the only problem. And I'm praying this year, if, the, if we, we transgressed against God, may God forgive us. By the way, every sacrifice that was made, including thanksgiving, it was done because of God's mercy. By the way, every, even the scripture we have, made there, we have read there, you will realize it is because his mercies endure forever. Thanksgiving demonstrates the mercies of God. Thanksgiving only comes in because God has been gracious to us. Not because we deserved it, but because of his mercies. 
By the way, let me tell you something here. The mercies of God are better than anything you can imagine. Amen. His steady first love, some Bibles call it that. His mercies. That's all that makes you who you are today. If it was not the mercies of God, you would not be sitting in this sanctuary today. It is the mercies of God. The mercy of God that makes you who you are this wonderful morning. So Adam lost it. And how did he lose all these good things? Adam lost him because of sin. Because of sin. I won't go into the details. I've just said here, unfortunately, Adam sinned and lost his relationship with God. This brought about what we call as the curse that was afflicted upon man. The curse. Now, I'm going to make a, a very important point where I'm going to end. And I want you to get this point clear because I'll pick it up from there next Sunday. Because this is what I always used to think and it wasn't true. Okay? Very important to know this. God never cast Adam. Very important to note. God never cast Adam because God loves Adam. So you, if there's any condemnation on you, please, God doesn't condemn you. The Bible says, for there is now no condemnation. Now no condemnation because of what Christ has done for us. I, I can stand assured that although I lost it, I can regain it. Because there is now no condemnation. God never cast Adam. After Adam had sinned in the Garden of Eden, a story you know. Because with all the things God had given Adam, he gave him a free choice. He says, listen, if you will do what I'm telling you to do and you don't do ABCD, you can enjoy them. And the golden rule is this. You can only enjoy those things that God has given you if you love him. And number two, if you obey him. When you love God and obey God, God will always keep his promise. As we enter the year 2024, let's enter the year 2024 with loving God and obeying what God has told us. And if we, if we do that as you and as the church, believe me, the year that is coming ahead of us will be a year of no struggle in your life. Adam disobeyed. And because of that, the Bible tells me, God, and this is the point I'm leaving you at, God targeted Targeted the source of his provision. And listen to me. Everything that is going on around us targets the source of our provision. Am I communicating? Even, even the struggles you are going through, they have targeted the source of your provision. The fuel going up is targeting what? It's in provisions. When you pay more money for fuel... Whatever you would have used to eat hamburger, probably to eat pork in the morning, or to enjoy what? Pizza. My sister loves pizza. All right? It's targeted. When you, you fall sick and you go to the hospital and pay bills, what, 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 is, what is being targeted? Your provisions. It means where you are supposed to be enjoying, it, has, it, 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 it depletes, it gets into some other place. When your children can't go to school, it targets your source of provision. When you cannot live in a good house, it is targeting the source of your provision. So God didn't cast man. He realized because he loves man, the only thing that would move man into acknowledging him was the source of his provision. And believe me, thanksgiving is when we acknowledge God as the source of what? Our provision. Amen. I don't know that you're listening to me. Amen. When you come to God and you saw this year, Lord, from January to December, you provided for me. For me, I'm, I want to give a confession here. This year, the Lord has been gracious to me. You know, some of us never give testimonies. I was, I, I was struggling with uh, cholesterol when the year started. But I'm telling you, I'm ending with no struggle. Somebody's looking at Pastor Mlema wondering, this a small body, can it really have cholesterol? Hey, I had cholesterol. Cholesterol. And even somebody put me on drugs. Let me make this confession so that the devil can know he's defeated. On what we call as statins. You know statins? Those drugs, when you get onto statins, you live on them forever. 
At some point, I said, no statins in my life. Small tub like this. You eat that a small tub. And sometimes all your bones just break. You may see me preaching here and you don't know my bones are just broken. I'm just doing my best. All right? I told God I don't want to eat those statins anymore. And I can tell you I'm not in statins. I'm not. He is the source of my what? Provision. You know, God, God understands you. And he knows you. Believe me, there are things in your life that nobody may know. But when you check and you audit yourself, you realize God has been gracious. You look at your life. You look at your family. You look at your job. You look at what God has given you. You look at the things that God has done in your life and you realize it's only him who can give you what you have. Amen. I wish I had more time, Pastor Joyce. But I'm going to end. But listen to me. God never cast you. And you are not under curse. The only thing which, the, which, which, which w- 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 would cause you to struggle is the source of your provision. Provision, if it's steady in your life, it sustains you. And once it sustains you, it settles you. It means now you can sit back and settle. And I'll show you in scripture, men and women who violated God's obedience in their lives. People like this first man in the Bible, the first, the first mother in the Bible. What was his name? Cain. The Lord targeted his provision. I'll show you in my next scriptures. Targeted his provision. He told Cain, Cain, how many of you can quote that scripture? Cain. He told Cain, now cast is the land. When you try to dig the land, the land will not do what? It will reject you. You know, there are people who the land has just rejected. You go for a job, you have all the papers. Somebody looks at your papers. Somebody who has no paper arrives. And the person without papers is given the job. And you, you are not given anything. Have you ever seen that type of thing? You, you have a kiosk and you are wondering. You are selling the same things which your neighbor is selling. But people are always going to your neighbor. Now, where we? Yako unaeka sukari na kamya kamitano, ujauza takilotano. And you keep wondering, why is it that nobody is buying from my shop? This is why people go to witchcraft. This is why people try to use all types of charms to try to appease themselves over what they are doing. And you wonder what has happened to me. You look at your neighbor and you see your neighbor is prospering. But you, you are still remaining like that. It is because sometimes, I'm not saying always, it's sometimes the land has rejected you. You enter into your village, homa comes, malaria comes. You run away. The Bible says, he says you will be a vagabond. It means you will be running from point A to point B. When you come here, people reject you. When you and God warned people, says, I don't kill him. By the way, you leave a vagabond. That is targeting the source of your provision. Can I read the scripture? Then I leave it. We have communion. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to verse 18. I'll end there. I'll pick it up from there next Sunday. I've just gone halfway my sermon. I mean, half of what I wanted to share this morning. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. I hope you're getting something. Okay, 17 to 18, to 19. It says this. And unto Adam he said, can you read with me? What did he say? Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. What did he do? Can you read with me? He says, cast is the ground for thy sake. Cast is... The ground for thy sake. Then he says, In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of your life. Let's continue reading verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. I think it's up to verse 19. Let's go to verse 19. 19. Help me here. What? In the sweat of thy face, Shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground? For out of it thou was taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now, you see, this is the only curse that God gave in the Garden of Eden. He never said, Adam, you are cursed. No. God targeted the source of his provision. And I want to finish by saying this it is the source of our provision. The source of our provision 
the source of our provision, and I repeat again, the source of your provision that is targeted. In thanksgiving, we tell God you are the source of my provision. Adam failed the test of acknowledging God as the source of his provision. When God has done it, you never remember him. The year ends and it's ending. We never acknowledge him as the one who has given us or who has been good to us. That's why the Bible says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our, provi- uh, the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. And the scripture we read, the first scripture, if I could just repeat it one more time here. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come unto his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. He is he who has made us, and we are his. That's thanksgiving. We are his. You don't belong to anybody. Believe me. You don't belong to any person in this world. You don't belong to your company. You don't belong to your husband. You don't belong to your wife. You don't belong to your, to, to, to your, to your tribe. You don't belong to your church. Hear me. You belong to God. And everything that is yours belongs to who? To God. Every good thing in my life belongs to who? To God. So God made three, th- he cast three things. He caused three things to happen. And I will expound on those three things next Sunday. Number one, that he, ca- that he caused to happen quickly. Number one, the Bible tells me the first thing that God did, if you can read your bi- the Bible with me, he said, sweat, sweat and sorrow. Sweat and sorrow. In sorrow and in sweat. That's the first thing. To me, that is struggle. I've never seen anybody waking up in the morning and just saying, oh, wonderful. I'm going to work all white, whoosh, urabashanta. I think it only happens the first one week when you're employed, isn't it? <laughs> when you are looking for a job for a very long time and then you've been employed. That's first one week. You are very excited. Even those who work in the church, Pastor Joyce, the first one month or two months when you got, when you got your place, you feel so nice and you feel like, I just want to be there. But after two, three months, do you still behave like that? I'm just giving an example here. Now listen, the Bible talks about the curse of sweat and the curse of sorrow. We'll talk about it. And then number two, the curse of thorns and thistles. Thorns and thistles. They will, say, they will grow to thee, to Adam. Thorns and thistles. We'll look at that. And then number, number three, what I'm calling here, the curse of death. The curse of death. By the way, death, as I said when I was starting this sermon, death is inevitable. It's inevitable. It means the ground which God had blessed had to receive back what belongs to it. And this is why people die. We don't die for any reason. We die to go back. Because the ground which was supposed to bring forth to us became now the target. Instead, it swallows us. It takes us. But glory be to God, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is the, your victory? We'll see at what Christ has done for us. And because he's done it for us, we have victory over all those things. Amen. The Lord bless everyone of us this morning. Amen. Thank you for listening to me. I close it at that point. Please stand up on your feet and let's make a prayer together. Hallelujah. Father, we are grateful for this morning, for the privilege and the opportunity of helping us to be in your presence. Thank you for this month of December, a month of thanksgiving. Lord, this is the month when we remember you and we thank you for what you've done for us, for good things and for whatever may have seemed bad in our eyes because in your sight, it is all good. When you made Adam and you put him in the Garden of Eden, you looked at all what you, have do- you had done and you said it was very good. I pray today that, Father, everything will be very good in the sight of your people. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for being gracious to us. Thank you because each one of us can see the goodness of our God, the love of our God. When we look back, we can see there is no loss, but we have gained. Lord, we have gained in our workplaces, in our businesses, in our communities, in our homes, in our families, Lord, in our church and in this nation. 
Because in the hard times, that's when God proves himself alive. Lord, we are thankful, even for our nation, our economy. We are thankful, Jesus, for giving us an environment where we can minister to you and we can preach the word of God. Thank you for your people that are present in this house. I pray that this month, as we read your word and as we look upon you, Lord, will be a month of great thanksgiving. And so bless your people. Bless your people. If there be anyone here, Lord, who has never known you as his dependent, may you this morning reveal yourself to him or her. Lord, if there is somebody who has never given his or his life to Jesus, still living under the yoke of sin in his life, may you change that man this month, that this may become a month of a relationship with you. Because Jesus died for us and took away the curse that was upon us. So that, Lord, we can be redeemed from that which was cast upon our lives. That's why the Bible tells me a thorn, of, a thorn was put upon his head. The Bible tells me he sweated and the sweat came out as blood. The Bible tells me, dear Father, he overcame death and came out of the grave to signify the work that he did for us on the cross, to reverse the curse that was upon Adam. And today we are children of God. Father, bless your people and bless us this morning. We give you praise and we give you honor. 